All right, well, thanks everyone for coming to another edition of uh, the One Pass thematic series on steady waterwaves. Um, today we have uh, with us Sam Walsh from the University of Missouri. Uh, and as you can see, he'll be talking about waterwaves with density stratification and, or sorry, or localized vorticity. <laughs> uh, Sam? Uh, well, yeah, so thank you, Ian, and thanks to all of the organizers and especially Walter for the kind invitation um, to participate in this series. It's been uh, really great so far. Uh, yeah, so I apologize for the, the clunky title. Uh, I was, I w it was requested that I talk about these two topics, which are topics that I, that I have worked on myself and which I, I really do enjoy and, and I believe are sort of at the forefront or one of the important um, frontiers for the sort of research. But uh, I mean, sort of thematically, they are kind of distinct. So it's going to be really a segmented talk first on, or actually first on localized vorticity and then second on stratification and um, you'll have to provide your own sort of unifying framework because I, I, I couldn't come up with one. And I should also say this is, I mean, I'll talk about other people's work, but a lot of it is mine with many, many other people. So uh, even though I'm the only author listed there, it's, it's certainly not, uh, not just me. Okay, so just as a, as a starting point, let's try and, and um, talk about water waves in, the, in a very general way. So I'm gonna look at, uh, so we're thinking of water, a body of water, everything was gonna be in two dimensions for this talk, just for simplicity. So we're gonna imagine it uh, as living in some region space, omega. It can be time dependent for the time being, so I'll write omega of t. And uh, we're going to treat sort of the simplest case where omega of t is some is lies been below the graph of an unknown function. Let's call it eta, the free surface profile. So it can't be, you know, we're going to have overhanging waves in this in this setting, but it, you know, it's a still pretty. It's unknown, so there's quite a, a lot of variety there. Above omega, for now at least, we'll just imagine this vacuum. So or basically a region of, of constant pressure. We don't really care about what's going on there. And then below, uh, we're going to imagine that either there is a flat bed at y equals minus d, or if you like, you can imagine minus d is equal to infinity, so that, or minus infinity, so that the whole thing is just unbounded vertically. So both of those cases are, are, are of interest. So to, to have actually water, you need to, I mean, well, the usual model for it at least is the, the, the Euler equations. And um, so let me just, I mean, I think we've seen them quite a few times already throughout this program, but just to, again, to fix a bit of notation. Uh, that actually I won't even be consistent with throughout the talk, but nonetheless. Um, so the, there is some condition on the top uh, where of the, of the domain where it meets the air, and that's that, uh, so there's kinematic and dynamic. Kinematic says roughly that the particles on the surface have to stay there, so air particles don't penetrate the water, water particles don't penetrate the air, and they just sort of slide along this interface. Uh, the dynamic condition is a bit more complicated. It tells you something about uh, how the pressure behaves. Either it uh, is constant, uh, if there is no surface tension or if there's surface tension, there's a jump which we prescribe due to some surface geometry. We'll, we'll come back to that later. Uh, on the bed, we just have again a kinematic condition. So that says particles can't move through the bed, pretty reasonable. And in the interior, we have, okay, what's displayed there is the first of the Euler equations, which is the conservation of momentum. Uh, v is the fluid velocity. It's a two dimensional vector field. Uh, rho is the density. and I. One thing to keep in mind here is that rho need not be constant, so that's a bit different than uh, some of the other talks so far. Capital P is the pressure, uh, and this bold G is just the a constant vector where the gravity for the gravitational um, acceleration or force to the gravity. Uh, so it's just pointing downward in this picture. So in the interior, so this is the kind of the standard setup that you know for Euler. If you have non-constant density, then you need to also say something about how it evolves. And the, the right physics usually is that you want it to be, um, you want some sort of a continuity equation, which means that the, each fluid particle's density is conserved in time, which ends up being something of this form. Okay, this, is all, this is satisfied trivially if the density is constant, of course. And then finally, because we're looking at water, the, the typical scenario uh, is that it should be, the flow should be incompressible, uh, which means that uh, the velocity field is a divergence-free vector field. Okay. So that's the, the basic setting that we're gonna be looking at. All right, so the, the main character, or one of the main characters of this story is the vorticity, and, and which is just the curl of the velocity field. I mean, okay, we're in two dimensions, so you have to interpret curl in a, uh, you know, 
not exactly the way you would in Calc 3. But I mean, the idea is that it's, you know, it should somehow be, you can think of it as a scalar quantity. And it's, if, if it's just, if you were, you imagine it were a three dimensional vector field, then only one component of the, of the curl will be non trivial, and that will be what we're calling the vorticity. And it's minus dx, the horizontal variable of the vertical velocity, plus dy, the vertical variable of the of v1, the horizontal velocity. So it measures, of course, the uh, instantaneous rotation in the fluid, or imparted by the fluid velocity. So it's, uh, it's entirely possible to just completely throw away everything else and just think about what's going on in terms of, uh, of the vorticity. So you can recover the velocity flow from the vorticity using um, the Savar law. And in 2D, this is actually very easy to see uh, where it comes about. And, and we'll want to, to, to understand this for a little bit later. So let me just step through it very quickly. I mean, one, one consequence of having a divergence three vector field in a simply connected domain is that you can write it as what I'm calling the gradient perp of a scalar quantity. So that means you take the regular gradient and you rotate it counterclockwise by 90 degrees. So that's this gradient perp. And it's always, you can always find some function C, which we call the stream function. It's defined on the fluid domain for every time T. And you know, it's gradient perp gives you back the, 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 the velocity field. This is just um, vector calculus. And then, okay, so just taking the curl of V is, and, Okay, is this quantity that that should be a dx1, dx2, of course, and that's just the Laplacian of C. So, if you uh, want to recover the the velocity field from the vorticity, you do it by first inverting the Laplacian on omega. That gives you back the stream function, and then just taking this gradient perp, or taking the gradient and rotating 90 degrees counterclockwise. So, if you know omega, and if you can figure out an appropriate way to define what the inverse of the Laplacian is, whatever the boundary conditions you want then these two, you can always go backward from the vorticity to the velocity. So uh, what is the, I mean, so that should suggest that somehow there's a, there's a good equation that governs the vorticity and that is, that is tr it's definitely true. So just take Euler equations and take its curl or the gradient perp if you like, and you get a, a nice evolution equation for omega. Uh, so the left-hand side is just, you know, omega is omega plus V dot gradient omega. And the right-hand side is maybe a little bit unfamiliar. If you have, uh, if you're not familiar, if you have not done a lot of density, uh, non-constant density stuff, you, you wouldn't be familiar with this. But you get a gradient perp, so the gradient of the pressure, but rotated, dotted with the gradient of rho, and then there's some one over rho squared term of form. So this is something called uh, the Barrow Clinic uh, vector if you were in 3D. Uh, so this, this tells you that somehow, if you have stratification, meaning the density is not constant, then generically, the right-hand side is not going to vanish. There's no reason why the, 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 le the, uh, the gradient of the pressure and the gradient of the density should be um, parallel. So that you really need to, uh, so I mean, the stra density stratification will create vorticity. So you can't, you can't ignore vorticity if you want to look at non-constant density, the two really go hand in hand. On the other hand, if, if you do have that the density is constant, then the whole right-hand side there is just equal to zero. So we have that the vorticity is transported. You can have dt of omega plus v dot gradient omega is equal to zero. And this is one of these magical uh, features of two-dimensional fluid motion. This is not true in three dimensions, but it is true in two. And that's, uh, I mean, sort of the first half of the talk is going to deal with the consequences of that. And the second half will come back to the, um, the sort of density stratification regime. Okay, so the first part is, is localized vorticity. All right, so again, now let's focus on the second the scenario. The density is constant for until I, until I say otherwise. And uh, what what does it mean for the for the for the vorticity to be transported? Well, if you sort of introduce uh, the Lagrangian flow map or the particle trajectory map, meaning you just integrate forward the the velocity field, so you just solve x dot of t is v of t of x. So this is, if you like, the position of a particle uh, at later time, uh, at time t that started off at, uh, given, given its position at time t equals zero. So we start, say it starts at identity. Okay, then it, it's the time derivative of omega at t of x just by chain rule is uh, equal to zero. So what the transportation of the dense of the vorticity is telling you is that each fluid particle, if you follow it, the vorticity at its location is conserved. So through all, all time. And this is a, a very nice property. And one, 
you know, immediate consequence of it is that if you start off with your vorticity concentrated in some way, so I, I mean, either, uh, well, we'll define, there's several ways where that can be understood, but I mean, generally speaking, if it's concentrated, then it should remain concentrated forever, or at least for a very long time until sort of secondary effects uh, take, take over. So for instance, if you have uh, the initially you are just, uh, your, your vorticity is just a characteristic function. So it's like a constant in some region in space and zero outside of it. Um, so let's say that set is D, then it's gonna remain a characteristic function for all time. And you can actually just see what is its, its support is just found by uh, propagating that initial um, set by the, the, the flow map. And so, if your vorticity is just uh, you know, stuck in some sort of a compact set, it will, it will remain there or it, uh, along its, the propagation of that set for all time. And in particular, if you have no vorticity, so the velocity is curl-free initially, then it's gonna be curl-free forever. So now this is a very convenient property. So here's some um, sort of very nice examples of what localized vorticity looks like. Actually, I'm cheating a little bit. These aren't water waves, these are atmospheric. Um, examples, but so what you're seeing here is cloud. I mean, uh, I mean clouds that are passing over islands. So there's an island here, there's an island here, and what happens is as it does this, there's a, a um, you know, there's the there's a shoaling effect, and so we have kind of these vortices that are being shed in the in, in the wake or the lee of the island. So, so these are uh, from satellite photos, I guess. And the idea is somehow that, I mean, outside of this region, I, I mean, I can see there's definitely a vortical structure, things are rotating here, but I can imagine these are sort of separate vortices that really aren't communicating with each other very much. And if I'm in far away from the wake, I mean, the, the, I'm not seeing much vorticity at all. And this is the, the kind of phenomenon that we're interested in studying. So a slightly less, um, well, less of a sheet, more of a water wave issue. This is, this is a, a simulation in, uh, in an actual fluid, so there's, they've um, dyed the, the liquid so that you can see a bit better the, um, the flow patterns. And they're, at the very bottom here, they have some paddles that they're sort of flapping back and forth, which is supposed to uh, simulate uh, a school of fish, I guess. And so you can see that because of the, you know, the boundary layer effects or, or you know, vortex shedding, you get these really fantastic um, sort of vortical patterns developing uh, downstream from the, uh, from the paddles. And, all right, so the, the idea for, if we're, you know, what we would like to be able to do is somehow understand how these, you know, these vortices are moving around uh, and without trying to, you know, grapple with the entire system, we want to really just imagine that, uh, how can we sort of simplify things if we know that the vorticity is really highly concentrated in certain regions rather than being everywhere. And hopefully there are, there are ways of, of approximating things. Okay, so that's the, that's the obje eventual objective, but just to introduce a bit of terminology. Okay, so as, as in all the other talks, um, we're, we'll call a wave steady or traveling if it solves this waterway problem, but it does so in a very uh, particular fashion. So if you choose a reference frame moving with speed, let's say capital C or lowercase c, then the wave appears uh, independent of time when, I mean, if you're in this moving reference frame. So these are, uh, much, I mean, when if you do this, the time evolution becomes, I mean, you no longer have to worry about time evolution if you're trying to fit existence theory, you really just have a, a steady problem. Okay, so it should go without saying that it's, it's not all obvious that these waves should exist, I mean, waves at all. I mean, this has been a very big problem. I think many of the uh, previous speakers have, have touched on this. But all right, so there, there is a, there's an enormous history of, a, of work on water waves, um, much of which has been surveyed uh, already. Uh, by far, the majority of it is done in the irritational regime, so you just take omega to be uh, zero identically. Um, but you know, rotational waves do occur, and they are uh, very important um, in oceanic modeling and many other reasons. I mean, for, exa for example, we just saw that uh, if you have any sort of density stratification, this should give you some sort of vorticity. Um, you can have these uh, boundary layer effects, which create uh, vort vort uh, vorticity in the bulk temperature gradients, um, wind forcing, or any number of, of, of uh, external force. So for that, for that, if you really want non-trivial vorticity, then there was, uh, I mean, some very, very early work uh, by Dubrajak Katan in the 30s, and then not much of anything uh, until this big breakthrough of Konstantin Strauss in 2004, which uh, really led to a, a huge um, 
renaissance of, of work in this area. Okay, so I think I've lost the focus here. There we go. Okay, so let me write down the equations of motion now for um, steady waves. So I've moved everything to a, a, a moving frame. So there's no time dependence for the time anymore. Omega has become omega. Omega of t has become omega. Eta just depends on x. And okay, y equals minus t is still there. So eta is the free surface profile. And all right, so the, now I'm going to think of v as the relative velocity. So it's the velocity in the moving frame. So the time derivatives are all gone. I've, remember, I've thrown away the density. It's just, just to take it to be 1. So the Euler equations and the momentum equation is just this sort of simplified form there. And the divergence-free condition, well, that's, that's still there, obviously. Uh, but we said that um, it's equivalent to being, having divergence-free. Being divergence-free is equivalent to being able to say that you can write v um, as the gradient curve of some, uh, well, this now it's going to be a relative stream function. So that seems to be a, a reasonable thing to do. And in fact, we can rewrite the Euler equations or the, the momentum equation by just sticking in, I mean, taking the gradient perp and then writing in terms of C. And the advantage of doing that is taking any derivatives at all kills the gravity and the gradient perp will kill the, 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 uh, the pressure. So once we do that, we get something which is a little bit funny looking, but is now a scalar equation. And it's telling you something, the, so the gradient of C is uh, orthogonal to the gradient of the Laplacian of C, which remember is the vorticity. So this is like a Poisson bracket, if you like. So now the problem is there's no more velocity fields. It's all scalar, which is great, uh, even if it doesn't look a little bit strange. And now finally, I'll put the boundary conditions in. If, if you write everything in terms of the stream function, they take the following form. The kinematic condition is very nice. It just tells you that there's some sort of uh, Dirichlet conditions for C. So we can normalize it. So C is going to be a constant on both the top and the bottom. We can normalize the, top, the constant on the top to be zero throughout the talk. That makes things easier. If there is a bottom, meaning it's not finite depth, then let's just take C equals m to be the constant there. It could even just be one, in fact. And all right, so the finally, the, the, the uh, dynamic condition is uh, much less appealing. Uh, well, I mean, it makes things interesting, but it's much more difficult mathematically. We have one half the gradient of C squared, that's the kinetic energy density, plus uh, G eta, which is the uh, potential energy density. Uh, then we have to, add, if, if there is surface tension, then we have to add uh, a term which accounts for a, a uh, jump in the, the pressure across the interface, which is in proportion to the, uh, the sine curvature. That's this kappa term, so equals zero, or equals a constant. So there's a bunch of constants here. The thing to keep in mind is if either, either alpha is equal to zero, which is the gravity wave case, or alpha is positive, in which case we have capillary gravity waves. We're getting second derivatives of eta, so this is a bit uh, exotic. And the main difficulty is that we have a full nonlinear boundary condition and that uh, the gradient of C appears squared uh, in magnitude. So this is what gives the, the water wave problem really, it's, I mean, a lot of it's, uh, it's mathematical. Uh, flavor. Okay, so that's what we're trying to solve. And um, the, the interior equation is a bit, as I said, not very pleasant. Uh, and the way in which we typically do deal with it is by noting, all right, how can you, how can you ensure that the gradient of C and the gradient of uh, the vorticity are orthogonal? Well, I mean, one thing is just imagine that they're functionally related. So that is to say, you can just write uh, Laplacian of C, which is the vorticity, as some function of psi itself, we call it gamma of psi. So gamma we call the vorticity function, and you know if you're if you're happy with this, uh, you just let gamma be given, and you and you move on, right? Uh, as we'll see, there are some situations where your guaranteed gamma exists, but it might not in, in the sort of general scenario. But one thing which I mean, if you have this uh, is immediate, is that obviously the vorticity is constant on the streamlines, which are the the level sets of psi. Right? If you fix psi, the vorticity is gamma of psi on that level set. Which is nice, but also it's a bit uh, of a problem. And okay, so how do you construct? So let's say we want to we want to show that there exists steady water waves. Well, I mean, this is a very difficult problem. You can't just you know open up Gilbert and Schrodinger and say here's you know theorem six point two. There exists a solution to this elliptic problem, right? So you need to do something a bit more uh, more creative. And the, typically the starting point is you need to do something perturbative, right? So we find a model solution, something which we can write down or we know approximately, and then we do some, some, sort, some sort of analysis nearby and show that there are more interesting solutions that actually exist. And if you're looking at uh, rotational water waves, um, 
actually even if you look at the irritation of waterways, the kind of natural starting point are shear flows or laminar flows or parallel flows, all the same thing, which just means that eta is equal to zero, so it's just completely flat uh, free surface, and uh, this, the velocity field is perfectly uh, horizontal, meaning that the stream function depends only on the vertical variable. Okay, so that's C is equal to capital C of Y. And then in this case, the vorticity is just found by taking uh, two derivatives of, of C. And all right, so this is what, uh, what Constantine Strauss do is what, I mean, most people, uh, I mean, the vast majority of the people working in this area have done uh, for looking at strat uh, stratified, or not stratified, but at rotational waterways. And so the idea is that, okay, the top drawing is what these, is a, an example of a, of a laminar flow or a shear flow. So the arrow, the relative position of the arrows tell you the velocity as uh, the relative velocity as you're moving up and down. So it's going, say, very uh, slowly along this area and very fast to the left along this area, along this line. So you do some sort of uh, bifurcation theory or spatial dynamics, whatever your, your favorite methodology is, and you find small amplitude waves, which are perturbations of this and where the streamlines are likewise slowly, uh, slightly perturbed from being just pure flat. And you're very happy with this because now it looks um, a lot more interesting. Okay, but you remember what we had just said is that uh, I mean, the vorticity is transported, meaning it's constant along streamlines. So if what we had meant to do was to create waves with localized vorticity, this is a real problem, right? I mean, as soon as you put vorticity on any of these streamlines, it's everywhere along the entire streamline because none of them are closed. So this wave is either if the, if the, if the streamlines look like this, either the wave is totally irritational or there's vorticity everywhere. I mean, at infinity and, and in the near field, there's uh, nothing to do. So, and again, this is just, because the streamlines are not closed, you, you can't localize the vorticity in this sort of configuration. So this model, uh, which has been so effective in other studies of waterways is just not the right way or not the most natural way to approach an existence theory for waves of localized vorticity, and you need to try something else. And what what you do, uh, or what I would I would suggest you do, depends really on what kind of localized vorticity you want uh, to study. So let's kind of start from the most extremely localized and build up. Uh, and the most extreme is that you have vorticity just at a single point. So this is what's called a point vortex. And all right, what does that really mean? Uh, so this is a, says this, okay, so I want to imagine that I'm looking at sort of measure valued solutions of this problem, or not, well, the, the vorticity is a measure. It's a Dirac delta mass with say epsilon. So epsilon is the mass, that's the vortex strength. And it's centered at some point, uh, the vortex center, which is this sort of X bar, which will be somewhere in, in, the, in the fluid. And for now, actually, I'm going to talk about the time dependent problem because the, um, we don't, we, we will we'll, we'll go back and look at the, the trip. The, um, first, we start with the time dependent problem, and then we'll go into the steady case. Okay, so this is a, a classical uh, sort of thing to look at, and it makes sense because, I mean, as we said, the vorticity is transported, right? So if you have it, if there's just a point which is where the vortex is, I mean, the vorticity is not zero, then you, know, you should only have a point where the vorticity is not zero for later times. And it should imagine that you're just infected by the velocity field in some natural way. Uh, the problem is that this is, uh, I mean, you run into kind of a measure theory problem, actually. So if you, or I think it's more of an analysis problem. You just think about it for a moment. If, if omega is a, is a delta mass, then V dot gradient omega doesn't really have uh, a meaning as a distribution because somehow, I mean, really roughly speaking, omega is like a delta, so V is like a, he a heavy side function. So you, this V dot gradient omega doesn't really uh, make sense. So you can't just take the Euler equation and say, okay, this is what I mean when I, when I, when I have a point vortex. You have to uh, think a bit harder and say, what is a, a, I have to weaken it even further and, and I have to do it in a way which is somehow uh, morally or physically correct. So there is a, a, a classical fix to this and it's based on the idea that somehow this, the point vortex should move around, the center of it should move around by the velocity field, but it shouldn't move itself, right? So, what does that mean? Well, you can think of taking the velocity and splitting it into two parts, the part which is generated by the point vortex itself and the part which is purely irritational. And the point vortex should only get moved around by the purely irritational part of the velocity. That's sort of the idea. And 
what this would say is that, okay, so dt of x bar is time to, is, this is just a, I mean, this is just an ODE now, right? But it's gonna get evolved, not by the full velocity field, that would be V, but I'm gonna subtract off VP, which is some velocity field or vector field generated by the point vortex. What does that mean? Well, remember that we know how to, via B of sub R, to recover the velocity field from the vorticity. So what we did is we said, okay, I invert the Laplacian, whatever that means, and I take the gradient part. So now the vorticity is supposed to be this delta function. So that this is somehow the right vorticity that's created by the by the by the this is the right velocity, excuse me, created by the vorticity, that vorticity. And okay, I'm doing this, let's say, in R2 just to make life easier. So the inverse is just found by um, convolving with um, the fundamental solution of the Laplacian. So this is uh, I mean a very classical thing. It was derived by both Kirchhoff and Helmholtz, and sometimes called the Kirchhoff Helmholtz model. Uh, for the uh, for the point vortices, so we just are imagining that uh, we will solve the Euler equations, the irritation Euler equations, in the distributional sense in the entirety of the fluid domain, except at the point vortex. And the point vortex itself will evolve, but not by by vect. I mean, by it will evolve by vecting according to this sort of uh, regularized velocity field, where I subtract off its own uh, contribution. All right. So this is. I mean, you can make. There are many different ways of arriving at this system in a, you know, from the Euler equations or even from the Navier-Stokes equations. And so these are sort of, you could imagine our uh, justifications or physical derivations. I mean, they go back to Mark Hero and Pogrenti, um, as we just went by Turkington earlier than that. Uh, you can also arrive at this by uh, looking at um, flow around a rigid body when you shrink the size of the body to uh, zero while maintaining the circulation. So, there, I mean, there's many different ways of, of getting the same model and it, it is uh, very thoroughly studied. Okay, so that's, uh, that's what we were trying to solve. That's what we mean by a point vortex is somehow um, a solution to this kind of weak inversion of the Euler equations. So how actually are we supposed to get, how do, I mean, how on earth are we going to prove that there are say steady waves for this? Well, the first thing we need to do is, is find a, a better formulation than trying to, to I mean, well, the equations were pretty bad to begin with, and um, we don't have the stream function anymore, not obviously, and we don't have, uh, uh, we also have to deal with the advection of this point vortex. So a, a reasonable thing to try is to um, note that, okay, you can basically, I mean, the, the whole Kirchhoff, uh, Helmholtz Kirchhoff model is sort of, has built into it the idea that one should be splitting velocity fields into rotational parts and irrotational parts. So let's sort of commit to that idea and write V as the gradient of fun, some harmonic function phi, that's the irrotational part, plus epsilon times gradient per of gamma. Gamma is gonna be a rotational part. It's not exactly going to be this, uh, just the fundamental solution of the Laplacian, right? But it's going to be something related to it or up, up to a harmonic function will be the fundamental solution. So gamma should be, uh, explicit if we know where the point vortex is and we know what the vortex strength is. But the hard part, of course, is the rest of the vector field. On the other hand, we, we have a lot of ideas as to how to deal with, uh, I mean, the irritational case because this is the, the highly studied um, problem. So because, I mean, it's a harmonic function, if I, if I know what it's doing, I know its boundary values on the top, then I know everything. Um, so it, let's just stop worrying about what capital phi looks like in the interior and just switch to looking at lowercase phi, which is its trace on the, or restriction to the, to the free boundary. Okay. So notice that phi is a function of just T and X. It no longer defined, it's not defined on unknown domain anymore. It's a much more uh, pedestrian object. And then we can recast the entire problem in terms of just one you know, unknown, which is now three uh, triple. So the, we need to know where the, we need to know the velocity, so the free surface profile, we need to know where, where the water is. We need to know sort of the, enough to recover the irritational part of the velocity field. And if I know X bar, then I have enough to recover the rotational part because I could just invert. So this is no longer a free boundary problem. It's just defined in terms of these things who have uh, spatial domain, uh, the real line or a torus if you want to periodic solutions. Okay, so this uh, this idea goes back quite a ways, and you know, based on it, there is a uh, there is an existence theory for um, steady solutions of this problem. Uh, the earliest ones are by Turkokarov and Filipov. Uh, these are finite depth um, gravity waves, so no surface tension. A little bit formal, but um, largely correct. 
so my own entry point to this was uh, work with uh, Joel Shota and Shang Chung Zhang in, in 2013. We considered the case of infinite depth, uh, capillary gravity waves, so surface tension and gravity both present. Uh, with a point vortex, uh, we did both the solitary wave, meaning um, that they're spatially localized, and uh, the periodic case. Um, if a periodic case, we get also uh, global bifurcation. The, the other ones are all small amplitude. Uh, and this is sort of later refined in a paper with, um, with Ming Chen and, and Miles Wheeler. Uh, for uh, Christopher Varholm looked at the case where you have capillary gravity waves in finite depth and you can have multiple point vortices. This is a very nice paper from a few years ago. Uh, and then Hung Lei, who's my uh, former PhD student, did the infinite depth case with a finite dipole, meaning you have multiple vertices uh, of opposite uh, strength. So right, there's, this is uh, something which you can, you can certainly do. Um, I see I'm going very slowly, but okay. I did want to talk about this a little bit because I think uh, almost all the talks in this series are about existence theory. And this is one of the few cases where you can really say something intelligent, uh, well, not intelligent, but something not uh, pretty quite strong about stability theory. So this is uh, partially because the, the, um, the way the vorticity appears in this, uh, this problem is so special. So what do I mean by that? So the, I mean, what is the, so, you know, the basic question is if you, you prove a theorem, these ways exist. I mean, do they, uh, are they actually observable in nature you know, or in some approximate sense? And, and more, and that would, I mean, for that to be true, one would expect that you have to be, have to be robust enough that you perturb them a little bit and they, they do persist. Um, this is a difficult problem, you know, even in finite dimensional, you know, for LDEs potentially and for PDEs, of course, it becomes extremely, uh, uh, delicate and even more so when we're talking about very complicated PDs like the waterway problem. Uh, and for one way in which that becomes apparent is that the choice of norm is, is, uh, is obviously quite uh, delicate uh, as well. So in particular, if you, the whole problem is translation invariance. So if you take, you have a solution and you just shift it to the right by any real number S, that's still a solution to the problem, right? It's really the same solution. So uh, somehow we don't want to think about these as being different if I'm talking about uh, robustness to per perturbations. And uh, the suggestion then that, I mean, this indicates that we should be somehow looking at metrics that uh, slide with the waves that allow you to um, readjust sort of the frame so that you are, you're looking at the shape rather than the position, absolute position in space. And you can think of this also as just modding out the symmetry group corresponding to horizontal translations. Uh, so this is an idea that, I mean, in PDs, it's usually referred to as orbital stability or instability. And the orbital, uh, somewhat confusingly, re refers to the orbit of the group action, the translation group, rather than um, the time evolution. Okay, so there we have a, a, a result on this, um, which I guess uh, just appeared in print, um, so which was with Christopher Holm and, and Eric Fallon. Uh, so it does turn out that if you look at the capillary gravity waves that were the small amplitude ones that are that were constructed um, in infinite depth, I guess with uh, Chung and Jalal, that these are in fact conditionally orbitally stable. If you have uh, if they're small enough, and if you have a small enough amount of um, vorticity, um, and then sort of surprisingly to us, at least at first, is that if you take you have two point vortices, so you have a, a finite dipole then actually exactly the opposite is true. So in that case, if you, uh, they are orbitally unstable. This was a result of my, uh, again, of my, uh, my student, uh, Hung Lei. Okay, so it actually came out a bit earlier, but I mean, okay, the, this paper was written first, but uh, the journal was a bit slow in putting it online. Okay, so uh, I, I'm not gonna have any time to talk about what the proofs of these are, but I'll just say that they, I mean, they exploit somehow the Hamiltonian structure of the system and, um, there is some ideas uh, that go back a long way to, to Benjamin, I think, and, and really uh, in, in rigorous form or in systematic form to Kirlaka, Chaton, and Strauss. So there are versions of that theory that one can uh, bring to bear on this problem to, to deduce uh, stability or instability. Okay, and this is, again, because somehow the, the way in vorticity manifests in the system is so special. Okay, so um, one step less, singular uh, than having just vorticity at a single point is to have vorticity um, in a compact region. And this is what's usually referred to as a, a vortex patch. So the support of omega is now um, some 
set D of T, which is compactly inside uh, the, the fluid. We call D of the patch. And the simplest case, which I think we talked about, is that you have that, um, that omega is just some uh, constant multiple of a characteristic function. This is the usual meaning of the word patch. And this is, I mean, it's particularly in either uh, in the whole plane or in a bounded, a fixed domain. Uh, this is a, a very classical problem, which was studied uh, quite intensively and I see really beautiful mathematics surrounding it. But um, we're not interested in, in the whole plane for this, uh, for these talks, right? We're interested in water waves. So the, the question is, can you actually find a water wave which has one of these patches inside of it? And uh, so the answer is, is yes. So this is also in the, that same paper uh, in 2013. So we show that you can um, find a vorticity. So it's a C0 vortex patch, meaning that the vorticity is globally, uh, actually it's Lipschitz continuous, um, and, uh, but compactly supported. And the basic idea is the same somehow. Well, it, it starts off with this, this, the same principle. So we really want to think of D, uh, which is the, the support of the vorticity as the image of, of some small ball under a near identity conformal map. So which, and then the shape of the patch will be determined by that map, which becomes one of the unknowns. So inside the patch, we, we solve this sort of semi-linear elliptic problem. As we said, that's sufficient to, to get the momentum equations to hold. Um, near the free boundary, away from the patch, you can basically imagine that it, it behaves like a point vortex if you shrink the patch enough. So then it becomes very similar to the problem where you have the point vortex. And then the hard, hard part is that you have to match the two along the boundary of the patch. So this gives you an additional condition of what the geometry of the patch should look like. Okay, so I won't go into any of that details, but this is the basic idea. Somehow you really are using the point vortex as the model, but you're doing something very um, much more difficult because you have to solve a semi-linear elliptic problem and see how that solution varies in, as you change the geometry of the, of the patch map. Okay, so um, the last case uh, that I want to talk about is, is, is more recent work. So now, instead of having, um, having a patch so that the vorticity really is completely localized, it's compactly supported, you might ask reasonably, what about if it's just you know, decaying, rapidly decaying, but not, not compactly supported? And this is uh, you know, a very natural question. I think actually Chung Chung was asked this during one of some time which you talked about this this earlier work um, but it turns out that i mean it's really from a mathematical perspective completely different i mean you, the ideas that you use for one problem have no or you do you no good for the other and that's because there's not really a way to um to deftly divide the rotational and the irrotational parts of the velocity field you sort of have to deal with vorticity everywhere at least we couldn't find a way to do that uh, and moreover, you can't get away with what we were doing before, which is bifurcating from zero. I mean, that's really what a lot of those earlier papers were. I mean, the, the, the vortex patch and the point vortex are, are very slow moving ways with very small um, deformations of the free surface. Zero is not, not going to have, is not going to look like a, um, is not going to look like something which has exponentially localized vorticity. So uh, instead, uh, the idea was to look at a very different source, which is this, you know, enormous literature on uh, sort of what are called spike solutions uh, or spike layer solutions to um, singularly perturbed elliptic PDEs. These are uh, a genre of equations where you, you look at something like delta squared Laplace mu equals gamma of u. So a nice sort of semi-linear problem that looks very suggestive of the stuff that we, uh, we've been talking about. Uh, here D is, let's say, a bounded domain. That's what they typically do. And you compose, you know, normal boundary conditions, homogeneous Dirichlet, homogeneous Neumann, whatever you like. And delta has the physical interpretation of a scaling, a spatial scale parameter. So we, the usual question is, what happens as you take delta to zero? And this shows up in, in um, biological models where you're looking at, or chemistry, when you're looking at chemotaxis and, and concentration phenomena. So there are many, many authors that looked at this. Um, it's really a very beautiful topic and was uh, intensively studied. And the idea is somehow that if you, if you shrink delta to zero, what you should be seeing uh, hopefully is a, uh, an exponential spike that, that, uh, that occurs or some sort of concentration. So one way of seeing that is if you just rescale delta out, then you get something, you should be able to, you get something which is on a very, very large domain now. And if you imagine trying to solve the same semi-linear problem, but on 
the whole plane or whole of Rn rather than this bounded domain, uh, well, this is a very classical problem now. And you know, there are uh, very well-known conditions on gamma that tell you that you have uh, solutions of this that are ground states of so positive radial monotonically decreasing and exponentially localized. So that will form the model for what the solution on the bounded domain should look like as delta goes to zero. And that's the kind of uh, the missing ingredient that we needed um, uh, to replace these sort of the shear flows. Is now we'd like to uh, imagine taking something like this ground state solution, which is not really a solution on a bounded domain, but is close to a solution as delta goes to zero, and then use that as the basis for a um, for an ansatz. Uh, for the actual solution. So you think of, uh, and actually that, this is still just new here as a solution of the, um, of the semilinear problem on the bounded domain. So you think of it as the ground state rescaled and maybe shifted a little bit, and then you add on some small perturbation that you, that you need to do to satisfy the boundary conditions, for instance. So there's a boundary correction of some form. So that's a, that, this is a very classical idea. And as I said, it, I mean, through the 90s and early 2000s, it was, uh, thoroughly explored by a, a number of, you know, who's who of elliptic PDE people. Uh, so our idea was to try and adapt the same strategy to the water wolf problem. And all right, it becomes uh, a lot more complicated because in comparison to the sort of classical theory where you're looking at, you know, nice uh, homogeneous Dirichlet conditions on bounded domains that are smooth that are, and are fixed, uh, we're trying to do it on an unbounded domain uh, potentially, we're unbounded in the horizontal direction and uh, with a free boundary where there is a horrible boundary condition, this, this dynamic boundary condition, which, which you know, is, is uh, uh, fully nonlinear. Okay, so nonetheless, um, I'm going a little slower than I expected, so I, I won't go through all the details here, but I'll just suffice it to say that there are, ver there are choices of gamma which you, can, which you can use, and under those conditions, you do indeed have the existence of, um, of solutions of this problem, uh, which have exponentially localized vorticity. So these are what we would call the spike vortex. So that is their solutions of the, capillary, uh, the steady capillary gravity uh, water wave problem. The vorticity um, is given roughly like the, this ground state, which has been translated a little bit and then rescaled. And the point here, okay, so this is what the streamlines look like. Um, you have a slight, these are capillary gravity waves, so you expect that there's going to be a, a slight, um, that you should have a wave of depression, meaning that the um, free boundary is deflected downward. And uh, they're stationary waves, actually, so they don't move. Um, they're just uh, independent of time. And there's a critical layer, meaning that there's this line of stagnation points along this horizontal line where they, all the particle paths are turning around. And the Actually, the vorticity changes sign, so it's rotating in one direction at the center of the spike, and then as you move forward outward, it it, uh, it reverses. Okay, these are very strange. I mean, really uh, weird waves, and you can see that. I mean, I think this is every time one of us gives this talk, people say, "Oh, well, are, are these are these just limits of um, the vortex patches or something when you rescale them?" And the answer is is no. Um, at least that's my answer. I guess some of my, my uh, co-authors have said uh, have been a little bit less uh, definitive. But anyway, the, the point is that they're tiny, they're very, very small waves, but, and there's very, very small total vorticity. I mean, the integral of the vorticity is very, very small. But what, what distinguishes them from, um, from say the point vortex or the vortex patches is that it's, the vorticity is spiked. So the, the set of the measure, the set uh, where the vorticity is, is absolute value is greater than epsilon and it's going to zero, so it's going to zero and uh, conversion to zero in measure. L infinity norm, however, is, is blowing up, I believe, and then the kinetic energy, which is roughly the, the gradient of C, is actually O of one, so these as delta goes to zero. So even though you're shrinking the, the effective support of these things, they retain a, an O of one amount of, of kinetic energy, which is uh, really quite, uh, quite bizarre. And the reason why this should, I mean, the way you should understand this is that these are really, we're, we're taking these solutions of the problem on the whole plane and sticking them into the water wave and then just, you know, hammering them in somehow. So it's not a, uh, it, they're coming from a completely different source than these other types of, of localized vorticity waves in terms of um, their construction. Okay, so 
I've almost, I mean, I, this is, don't worry, I won't, I will go, I will skip some stuff here. And I, and I, uh, but I, let me talk a little bit about stratified ways. I, I have it till, I'm supposed to do an hour, right? Is that, is that correct? Or, okay. Stop me if you want. I'll go very fast here. All right, so stratification is something people have actually already talked about um, in two other talks. So I, I uh, so I'm not going to belabor the point here, but in the point, it is, it is a very important phenomenon. Um, in, in actual applications, it's it's ubiquitous in the ocean because of the presence of, of salt, so salinity or temperature gradients, and it's uh, it's extremely interesting because it, uh, I mean, both from a physical perspective because it has a, a very big role to play in ocean circulation, and from a mathematical perspective because having stratification actually allows you to have these enormous waves that uh, are in fact much larger than the waves that you observe on, on the surface of the water. So steady stratified waves uh, have been, I mean, as I said earlier, the, the existence theory, the first parts of it go back almost as, I mean, they're almost as old as the original work of de Bajakotan on rotational water waves. So, I mean, uh, you know, only 10 years after the, the you know, or in the same kind of period as the original kind of uh, Levi-Civetta and Necrosov equation uh, era. But there's a, so there's a vast literature on it and even if I hadn't almost entirely exhausted my time, there still wouldn't be enough time to talk about all of it. So I'm not going to, to even attempt to it. Uh, what I want to just do is talk, I mean, very briefly go through one case study, which is uh, our paper, I mean, that I wrote um, with, with uh, Ming Chen and Miles Wheeler. So this is on uh, large amplitude solitary waves with um, an arbitrary back background velocity. So these are solitaries in the sense that Miles described and which means that they're localized disturbances of some sort of background flow. And what we would like to do is imagine that that background flow can be chosen uh, to be anything we like. And we'd also be able to now, we have density stratification, so I want to be able to choose whatever density uh, distribution uh, that, I, that I like in this background flow. Okay. So this is a very selective, I mean, not even touching upon I mean, many, many results from literature, but at least this is sort of, a more recent results, so you can see where things um, where things are currently, <laughs> or what kind of problems people are looking at currently. All right, so the, again, this is the the basic equations are the same. I'm I'm just recalling what the the variables are. I'm switching now to using u and v as the components of the velocity field, just for uh, the sake of tradition. And uh, so this project uh, was done in the setting where there is no horizontal stagnation, meaning that uh, there are no fluids in the particles in the fluid that are moving faster than the wave itself. So that tells you that uh, u minus c has a sign. By convention, we take it to be negative. And what this means is if you write it down, uh, write down, well, the u minus c is cy or minus cy. So that tells you that the streamlines uh, are all extend from minus infinity to plus infinity, they have graph geometry. So we're manifestly not in the situation that we want to be if, for localized vorticity. These are all like the first drawing where everything is just nice and uh, highly non-localized. So a solitary wave uh, in this setting means that uh, it's spatially localized so that if I take X out to plus or minus infinity, the, the, velo the relative velocity field approaches the, I mean, uh, background flow, so the, the vertical velocity goes to zero, the, the, re the relative horizontal velocity goes to some u star, which is fixed, or f times u star, and density goes to some background density profile, and eta just goes to zero, so the free surface is, is flat at infinity. Um, we're going to think of rho star, this upstream density profile is given to us, u star is also given to us, capital F is uh, the fruit number, which I was talked about uh, last time, and is of course the, sort of the main parameter in the gravity wave case. Again, we have this continuity equation, and in, in density, in the, um, the con for when you have non-constant density, but in the steady case, this tells you that you have a sort of become the symbolized this statement, and what that tells you really is that the density is constant along the streamlines. So just as we did for um, the vorticity function when we we're looking at uh, steady rotational waves, you can imagine just prescribing the value of the density on each streamline, and, and we call that the streamline density function. So also written with a row, but just subtly different. It's not ver row here, it's regular row. 
And as we said, okay, there is some sort of a, a critical fruit number. This is known sort of from the, the folklore of, of or not even folklore anymore, but from the theory of uh, um, solitary waterways. And that's sort of where uh, these solitary waves should bifurcate. Okay. And the, so the main theorem is, which is sort of characteristic of what these types of results look like is that you fix any stream identity function with some you know, reasonable amount of regularity, you fix whatever, uh, velocity field you would like to see, so background velocity field infinity that you like, and you can find a global curve of solutions uh, to the, the solitary waves that have classical held irregularity, the precise amount doesn't matter, and the bifurcate from this sort of the trivial solution where you're actually, it's not quite this one, but it's a, it's a, it's a scale version of the, uh, the horizontal, of the velocity at infinity, and then with the, the fruit number um, beginning at the critical fruit number. And then the, one of the, the appealing features of this is that uh, just as you see for the Stokes wave problems, like which I think uh, Miles and also Vera talked about, and actually also uh, John Toland and uh, Walter, you see that if you follow the, this curve to its extreme, you get uh, waves that limit to, or get arbitrarily close to having horizontal stagnation points so that the U, C, U approaches C somewhere in the, in the fluid. Okay. You don't know exactly where in this setting, but it has to happen somewhere. Okay. All right, so um, I think I've been too ambitious and I will, uh, maybe it's better to just stop there before I, I lose everybody. And uh, okay, so there is a, a lengthy argument to get this, which is actually based off of um, global bifurcation theory that Miles touched on last time. You need to do something special uh, because you're on unbounded domains. And there's a way of rephrasing this problem as a horrible looking quasi linear elliptic PD on a bounded domain. And then one needs to do some sort of fancy bifurcation theory to, to deal with it. And actually uh, that, those ideas were originated in, in Miles' treatment of the rotational uh, solitary wave problem in, in his thesis. And then we sort of um, together, I guess, uh, formulate them as a more abstract and general theory, which was used to, to prove this theorem and others later. Okay, so this is the basic picture. You start off and you bifurcate. Okay, all right. So I, I yeah, I'm very sorry. I think I, I but I don't want to exhaust my time. So maybe I'll, I'll just stop there and, and ask for the, a lot of people to ask questions. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Sam. Um, all right, so as per usual, I'm going to have to go through this process of unmuting everyone by muting everyone. So give me one second. Okay, uh, Sam, please unmute yourself and everyone else, you now have the ability to also unmute yourself and, uh, and ask questions. So um, do we have any questions or comments for, for Sam? Well, I'll, I'll get the ball rolling with something uh, probably trivial. Um, back when you were talking about the exponentially localized things, your existence theory had uh, function spaces that were labeled HK sub E. What, what does that mean? Uh, let's. Yeah. Okay, so H, the subscript of E means that there it's even with respect to the horizontal variable. Oh, even. Okay, I was thinking maybe it had to do with an exponential weight or something. But okay. All right. No, no, no. I mean the the exponential decay rates we 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 do have very explicitly because you, I mean they they're modeled on these um, ground state solutions. So I mean, they, they have exactly uh, their radial and they have exactly this decay rate that's just sort of baked into the construction. But uh, we do all of the analysis in, in you know, boilerplate uh, HK H spaces with a little bit of um, evenness done in for, to ameliorate some of the degeneracy. Thanks. Anybody else? Uh, Sam? So the waves that you construct still in this case are depression waves mostly. Yeah. Um, is, it, is it necessary or is it a sign of related to the sign of the function that you choose? Could you make something that would be a, a wave that spikes at its maximum? Or I don't, I think that, uh, I don't believe so. I think that it comes to me, it's a consequence of the, um, in fact, you have capillary gravity waves, and I think uh, I don't have it in this slide. But where where does it come from? Is if you go all the way back to the the Bernoulli boundary condition, 
what you're doing is you look at this, you basically want to treat this netic as a, an elliptic equation for eta, and you're inverting that, that curvature operator. So the signs of those other terms tell you what eta should look like to leading order. And, and that just it becomes a depression wave from that. But there, I don't think there's, I mean, okay, the, so, the, uh, so if, you, if you want a wave of elevation, you would have to do this without surface tension. And that, uh, something that we're looking at uh, or we've been preliminary discussion about, but it's, uh, it's a very different um, situation. And maybe something a bit related. So when you put a, just a Dirac mass, yes. um, is there just a unique place? Could you, or do you have a picture of what it looks like? And could you, how much uh, flexibility did you have on the center? This is actually a numerical, I mean, I'm not much of an, I mean, I'm a terrible numerical analyst, but this is my, my, my amateurish computation of the, the surface for, the, for one of those waves. Um, you, can, you can place the point vortex anywhere you want in the, um, it, okay, so it has to always be beneath the crest, so it's directly below this line, or the, the trough, I guess, in this case. But or, vertically, it can be anywhere you like, and actually, um, when you do the stability theory, you look at uh, families of solutions that are parameterized by the wave speed. And as you, as you change the wave speed, in fact, the, uh, the height of the point vortex goes up and down. Uh, and in, I believe, right, okay. So you, then that's, I think that they're even more complicated. I mean, you can have them where, I think maybe in the case where you have multiple point vortices, there are certain sort of resonant positions that you have to avoid no. carefully, but otherwise, yeah. Sam, so, so there is a scaling variance, so you can rescale it so that as long as it's below the surface, it can be pretty much anywhere. Yes, right, exactly. But I, I, I meant, um, so when you, do the, when you do the stability theory, you don't, you don't use exactly the, the same curve as what we did in the existence theory, you, because you want to be able to, um, to use GSS, you need to, you want to parameterize by the wave speed. And, for that, you have to allow something else to vary. So we ended up just redoing it a little bit so that the, the, um, the altitude varies as you change the wave speed. But of course, you can put it wherever you like when you start off your bifurcation. Any other comments? Okay, well, thanks again, Sam. Um, as a reminder, uh, next week we have the final talk of this, uh, this somatic session, and it will be given by Eric Vollen from uh, Lund University. Um, also, for those of you who are in the US and have the right to do so, don't forget to go vote next week. Um, uh, see you next week. <laughs>